Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the adult Sunday school class, Believer's Chapel. We are studying the book of Proverbs together. We are in chapter 22, beginning in verse 18, and we are in an extended prologue here with the wise sayings, or the sayings of the wise. Now, from this point forward, or through the sayings of the wise, I'm not going to give you any guidance of how the how I will teach the proverb, because I think that they are self-explanatory, very clear. And matter of fact, we will actually even skip some of the sayings of the wise, because uh, we have covered them in a great deal of detail earlier through the book. So rather than have repetition on almost precisely the same word, we'll just move along. So beginning in, really we just finished uh, 2217, which was the first half of this uh, exhortation in this ancient prologue, we were to hear, and now beginning in verse 18 this morning, we're going to see the result of this hearing. Because it is lovely when you keep them in your... And now, uh, I'm not going to handle this in the exposition, so I'm going to just uh, explain the translation here. Your King James has within, I think that's also the translation of the New American Standard. If you have heart, it is not the word for heart. Uh, we translated this word uh, innermost parts in Proverbs 18.8, gossip that goes down to the innermost parts. In 2030, we translated it the same way, physical punishment uh, meant to cleanse the person goes to the innermost part. Punishment changes behavior. That was the point of the proverb. So what is this innermost parts? It's a reference to the emotional makeup of a person. It's uh, what makes you uh, different than someone else. You may cry, tear up over something that wouldn't affect me at all, or vice versa. I have used this uh, story before, but it is a perfect illustration. Uh, many years back, I was, uh, I was sitting across from Dan and I was telling him about uh, this radio program with Chuck Colson, Prison Fellowship, in which he was allowed under perestroika to go into the Russian prisons. And when he got there, he had a guide, but no interpreter. So he was told who the prisoner was, what the prisoner was in there for in this gulag, but he got no other guidance than that. And uh, he came to one prison cell, and he was told this man has been here for 10 years because he preached the Bible. And then they opened the door. And Colson described it very vividly, and I was giving that vivid illustration to Dan. He said, you walked in, and it wasn't a tile floor, it was a dirt floor. And there was this man under the window with the bars and the light streaming in over his head. Colson said, he looked at him and his eyes filled with tears. He went toward him, and they embraced. Obviously, the man knew who Colson was and that he was coming. And then, unable to communicate, 
Colson just bent down and in the dirt did the sign of the cross. To which that man bent down and retraced the cross in front of Colson. I was telling the story. My mouth was open when suddenly my friend Dan Duncan goes across the table with his index finger an inch off my nose and proclaims loudly, that man's a king. That's this word. It's the emotional response. What, what moves you? It can't be defined. You could call it psyche, if you will. But that is this innermost being. The text says, when they are fixed on your lips. So this would be the Word of God given to you in wisdom that becomes a part of you. It becomes a part of your DNA. You think like this, and so you speak like this. That's the idea. Now, verse 19, in order that your trust may be in the Lord, I teach you today, even you. Verse 20, have I not written for you 30 sayings, knowledge, counsel, advice? 21, to teach you to be honest in speaking, reliable words, to bring back reliable reports to those who sent you. Here's 22, tied to 23. A saying of the wise. Do not rob the poor person because he's poor, and do not crush the afflicted at the gate. And here's your purpose. Because the Lord will plead their case, and He will rob those who have robbed Him. Him. So here we begin verse 18, chapter 22, the second half of the exhortation and now the result of listening. Because it is lovely when you keep them in your psyche, in your innermost parts. This top line, the word lovely, Possessing a quality of beauty that appeals to people. The eye sees it. The emotional response of it. It's appealing. It was used in 2 Samuel 1.23. David uses the word to describe the devotion of Jonathan to his father Saul, the king. They were slain in battle. And David writes about it in poetry and calls that devotion between son Jonathan to Saul, king, as lovely. It appealed to David. David never wrote about his own father. But he saw something in Jonathan, and he called it lovely. The admirable quality of wisdom in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Jesus Christ being formed in you. And it's very attractive. That's what the Scriptures say. You know, just an aside, this man Jonathan, He's no second teamer in the Old Testament. He's very brief on the pages of the Word of God. But this is a man that needs to be studied. Uh, your index finger that has gone line by line through the Psalms and is well worn, you should go line by line through the life of Jonathan. I just put down words, single words, when thinking about this man's life. Here's what I wrote. Humble, 
valiant, courageous, bold, truthful. That's Jonathan. He is a splendid character, an amazing man. And to think of the hellhole that he was dug out of. His father Saul, selfish, self-centered, always interested in his own self. This is a new generation of the second generation that we know about. Jonathan, born again. What a splendid character of light. It reminded me of the words of Rosaria Butterfield. She was a champion to the homosexual cause in the United States. She was one of the leaders of the movement in self, tenured professor, Syracuse. And she was befriended by a pastor and his wife in that community over and over again. And suddenly she was drawn, attracted by their personalities, their kindness. She describes sitting in her pickup in a parking lot across the street from his church and watching families go into the church as she drank her Starbucks coffee in the morning. She did that for three weeks. Then came that day when she climbed out of bed with her short haircut, frazzled hair, t-shirt, and blue jeans, and went and sat right down the front, just waiting, she said, just on edge for somebody somewhere to say something. And all she got was kindness and warmth. It wasn't long before the regenerative Spirit of God took this woman from darkness to light and changed her. She makes a remark in her book that made me think of Jonathan. You never know, she said, where the person comes from that is sitting next to you in the pew. That is the loveliness of the appeal of Christ in people. The loveliness of Jonathan. So, we hear, we listen, and the result is we begin to think differently, and now we're going to start acting differently to keep them on our lips. You know, uh, Warren Duncan gave me uh, a whole box of reel-to-reel tapes of Donald Gray Barnhouse preaching back in the 50s. I listened to all of them multiple times. And he gave a masterful illustration. He said, when they brought that big block of marble into Michelangelo, what did you see? You saw just a big old block of granite, but not the artist. Not the artist. He looked at that block of granite and he saw David. And as he began to chisel and hammer, chisel and hammer, there was the head and then the shoulders and the torso and the arms and the legs. And he is to remark, as the pieces fall away, the image becomes apparent. That's what's happening with you and me. As we are in this Word, the pieces of the debris of the old man are shuffled away. And we emerge new and different. 
This is what we were made for. This is who we really are. Look at this line too. When they're fixed, it's the idea of lasting, something that endures. We've seen the word before. Psalm 104, verse 5, the world is set, the world is fixed. Psalm 11, verse 2, it is used of an arrow being fixed to a string of a bow. It is set in place. That's this word. The saint perseveres because he keeps the Word of God in his mouth at all times. It's fixed there because now this is Him. That's where that innermost part comes from. You can't cut it out. It's just a part of you. It's in you now in an indescribable way. And the Apostle Paul would tell us it is there with a seal of the Holy Spirit. That's regeneration. Here's 19. In order that your trust may be in the Lord, I teach you today, even you. So we move from the child in the home to the wise teacher himself. I teach you today, he says. Look at this purpose clause that opens the proverb. In order that. The purpose of the proverb. The purpose of the entire book of Proverbs. Here it is. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. It is the same word that we've had before. We've studied that word. Let me remind you. Alan and I, my friend, we are walking through a jungle together and we come to this vast gorge and there is this big bending bridge. It's kind of going like this as the wind blows. And I say to Alan, Alan, what do you think? Well, Alan's going to quote the King James. He's going to say Proverbs 4.26, ponder the path of your feet. All your ways will be established. I'm going to go find another route. And I say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look at this rope. And look at these slats that we're standing on. That's, that's decent wood. Alan, I think the, the bridge is reliable. That's this word. It's used throughout the Old Testament and often in a negative way, telling you not to trust the words of the false teachers or the false prophets. They will lead you astray. But your God is reliable. And isn't that what the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews tells us? Going back and looking at the Old Testament. That's what he was doing all through that epistle. And what was he telling us? Hebrews 11, your God is trustworthy. Here's Abraham. Here's Noah. Here's this man and this woman. Here they are. Look what happened. Consider the outcome of their faith, he said. Your God is reliable. Trust Him. What are you trusting Him for today? Trust Him. Here's 20. Have I not written for you 30 sayings? Wise sayings. 30 in number. But notice the contrast here. In the beginning, they are oral sayings, trustworthy and reliable, even for us today in Dallas, Texas at Believer's Chapel. Why? Because they are in written form. And they are personal. Look at that. For you. Personally. To you. Your God is trustworthy. You can believe Him. It's beyond speculation because they are in written form. 
Blessed is the man who always trusts them and believes in them. Somewhere along the way, we all heard that voice of the great shepherd. And we could all tell a different story about when we heard it, where we heard it, the time and the place. But we heard it. And we came. And we were translated from that moment from darkness and light. And now here we are. We are hearing the voice of that great shepherd and He's giving us, look at your text, knowledge, advice. From the mouth of God through the teacher, the writer of the Proverbs, now given to us. Which means that upon listening, we now act differently and our destiny will be different than what it was heretofore. 21, I teach you to be honest in speaking reliable words, to bring back reliable reports to those who sent or commissioned you. Look at this opening here. Very forceful to teach. That's why you don't have fellowship with God by a walk in the park. You don't commune with God by looking at nature. No. Revelation doesn't come from the creation. That ended in the garden at the fall. We are transformed by learning. Teach. Learning. Everything in this book is proactive. It is forceful to us. Here are the verbs. Listen. Heed. Learn. Do. Counsel from parents. Brought to us. The truth of God's Word is not natural. It's not instinctional. It's supernatural. The Apostle Paul uses the word hidden in 2 Corinthians 4.3. If our Gospel, he says, is hidden, it is hidden to those who are perishing. It is supernatural. And that's what separates it from ordinary knowledge. Look, E equals MC squared doesn't change my life. It may change my thinking. It may change how I view the universe. How I view space and time. And light and so forth. That doesn't change me. This Word transforms you. You are no longer the person that you once were. Because of this revelation. In order to be redundant, let me be redundant. Uh, the rocker of my generation, Neil Young, said he took walks in the Canadian forest and there he communed with God. Now, look, uh, he may enjoy the smells and he may enjoy the wind as it whistles through the trees. He may enjoy the wildlife that he sees, but he does not commune with God by looking at the creation. Because environments don't sanctify you. I said a few weeks ago, robes, candles, crosses, stained glass windows, they're attractive. They're inspiring. But they don't sanctify. My dear friends, Jesus Christ, John 17, in the upper room, He prayed, sanctify them by Thy Word. Thy Word is truth. I must be a student of that Word to have my character changed. 
Look at this word honest. It's more than just truth telling. It's conduct. Right, just, fair, appropriate. Our minds conform to His revelation and thus we speak to one another reliable words. There should be a sincerity in our communication with one another. And if not, why not? You know, I worked for 20, over 25 years in the oil and gas business. I worked in places where you had to wear a business suit and boardrooms. I was in offices where men wore white shirts and blue jeans and boots. I was actually out on some rigs on occasion and men were covered with grease and oil. I heard words that I didn't even know existed out there. But let me give you a word in business, in operations. It occurred in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 4. It struck me. It was Boaz coming into the field that he owned and he shouted out to his workers, the Lord bless you. And they responded, the Lord be with you. Now that's work. That's a work environment. Well, that's talking like we talk to one another at Believer's Chapel, isn't it? No. My friends, this word changes our speech as well as our conduct. Well, look at the repetition of reliable. Your translation may say true, certainly correct, accurate. All the way we speak, how important it is in the book of Proverbs. The way we speak to one another and the tone that we use with one another. Look at line two, the purpose clause, to bring back truthful, accurate testimony. We have no idea where this person came from that God sent, that God commissioned to bring that good word to us. But what's clear is the content of this instruction, these 30 sayings. What is in view is the full measure, the full development of the Word of God in you. In you. Now, now you'll be made perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. Here's 22. Do not rob a poor person because he's poor, and do not crush the afflicted at the gate. Wisdom, skill for living, never, ever, ever enriches himself at the expense of the poor and the weak. Never. Look at these opening, it's emphatic. Do not rob. Taking possession of something that is not lawfully yours. When wisdom sees the weak, the wisdom goes into activity. That's what they do. The weak, the poor people, destitute of material resources, thus He enables them to be protected. That's wisdom. It springs into action over the poor, over the weak. But let me add this important feature. Those who come across your path personally. You see, the Good Samaritan, he wasn't out doing reconnaissance that morning. Where can I find? Where can I see? Where can I look? No, he was, had an agenda. He was a busy man. He was on his way. When suddenly, this is what he saw. You know, very interesting in that proverb. That word to see occurs three times. 
the priest, the scribe, and the Samaritan. All, same word, saw. But this man acted differently. He sprung into action based upon what he saw. Jesus' words. Matthew 26, 11, The poor you will have with you always. <laughs> Look, I'm not called to straighten out the iniquities of society. I'm called to put wisdom in my heart each and every day. And as I do it, one single 24-hour day at a time, the Word promises that Christ will be glorified. That's my job. That's my calling. Look at line two, this word to crush. It's a verb to describe the weak and the poor. It occurs 18 times in the Old Testament, found only in the poetic sections of the Scriptures. The word is used as a figure displaying one's poverty, his inability, his weakness. The word actually means to pulverize, like you would take a, a marble and crush it with a big hammer, and it splits into hundreds of pieces. That's the word. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up. Let's just enjoy that for a moment. What is that? We don't know what it is. We have no idea. It's beyond what we see and hear, touch, taste, or smell. But it's real. It's a place. Wouldn't you love to have been there that morning with Elisha? and Elijah walking along when suddenly they are separated with a fiery chariot. And Elijah gets on. And Elijah screams out, Lord, behold, the chariots and the fire of the Lord. Wow, what a moment. It's real. But it's not here. It's not a part of this created order. That's where he's addressing this voice in its location who inhabits eternity. What is that? We're a speck. We're a tiny speck along the line of history. What is that? What is eternity? Whose name is holy. Oftentimes, I, I get on my knees and I say, you are so other. You are so other than me. I am saved by the blood, but I am corrupt and wicked and distorted and perverted from you. You are other than me. He says, I dwell in a high and holy place. That's His residence. But look at this amazing word. He says, Isaiah 57, 15, I am also with the crushed. Crushed. Pulverized. Weak. Humble of spirit. Why is He there? Why are you there, Lord? Why there? He says, to restore the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contract. That's power in the midst of weakness. And it's what Paul said he thrived on. He thrived on it. Why do I want to serve the poor? Why do I want to be a helper to the weak? Because that's where the Lord of glory is. And where He is is where I need to be. 
Now look at the location in this proverb. At the gate. So they're oppressed, they're pressured, pressured by the rich and the powerful. We help the afflicted, we help the oppressed because it honors Him. Let me tell you something else it does. It ensures your safety better than prudential or travelers with that little red umbrella. Psalm 41.1 Blessed power, potency on those who have regard for the weak. For the Lord will deliver them in times of trouble. He knows what you've done. And He will be there for you. Here's 23. Because the Lord will plead their case and He will rob those who have robbed them of life. The opening in our top line, because here's a new reason to be the protector of the poor. The Lord Himself in His invisible providence. That involves many times secondary sources. He will bring about His own outcome. Here predominantly, look at this. The name of the burning bush, the covenant name, the tetragrammaton, the four letters, Yahweh. Here he is, Lord, Master, covenant keeper. He will do something. We know, because we're students of the scriptures, we know what he did into Egypt, don't we? He injected himself didn't he? Defending his people that he called by his name and put his name upon it against the most powerful nation in the ancient world. And what did he do? By command, the voice of his mouth, he summoned frogs and gnats and locusts, darkness, blood in the Nile River. What is that? All secondary sources to display His power over the creation. Look at this word, plead. It's a legal term. Making God the accuser in the case or in the cause of the poor and the weak. This is an interesting word. Let me tell you where it was used. It was used by Absalom when he sowed the hearts of insurrection under David's nose. You see, he would wait at the gate in Jerusalem as people would come for an audience with the king. And he would say, tell me what your cause is. That's our word. What is it? What, is, what are you pleading? And they would, of course, bear their souls. Here's what happened. And... He was a great politician. He would say, I feel your pain. I understand, he said. Why, if I were only king, I'd see that you got justice. That's this word. He's always for the little guy. Our second line is marked by the and so, giving the consequences of the covenant name's involvement. To rob, to plunder. The idea is that all of poetic justice, that's what we call it, don't we? Comes fully to bear. The name, the covenant name, the name of the burning bush, He's going to plunder those who have plundered. He will rob. He will plunder those who took advantage. That's what He did to Egypt. That's what He did to the Pharaoh. And that's what He'll do for you and me. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion and splendor, 
girded with praise. You know, I've often thought, being in the business world, like I was for so many years, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, I have seen the affliction of My people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmaster. And I know of their sufferings. Men go to Wall Street every day and they place big money on companies because they think they understand the trends of the times. They understand the integrity of the way the company is built and how the company makes money. And therefore, they, they place big money on those decisions. And they're well thought through, well calculated. And I've often thought about that when I read this text. Because if you and I had been there, that's when I would have nudged you and said, let me tell you what we're about to do. We're going to sell everything we've got. We're going to load our little U-Haul. And we're going to go up to the teller's window and we're going to put it all on a big short of Egypt. It's finished. And can't you just see somebody? Somebody seeing that? And what would he say? You've got to be crazy. Well, you're a nut. Why? Why? This is Egypt. Look at the pyramid. This is Egypt. Well, let me tell you, friends. Think about your life. Think about your times. This is where history is headed. It's not floods anymore. It's not going green and we've got to keep the vapors from the sun. It's not that at all. It is what the Word of God says. Peter made it clear. It's going to be destroyed by fire. And when is that? Five years? Three years? Three months? Ten years? A hundred years? Who knows? But it's going to happen. But let me tell you, here's what you and I do today. We take all of our stuff and we put it in the back of that little U-Haul and we drive it around to the teller's window and we put it all on Christ. Because that's where history's headed. And that's where you and I are going to be. Put it all on Him. You're no fool. You know the revelation of God and you know His Word is true. He's got the plan. He's got the purpose. And we will be with Him in that light, that judgment forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for the study of the Scriptures today. How they transform us with the knowledge of God which is from above, not from men. That we may know what is the good and appropriate Word that we can live by, that we can trust in, because You are reliable in everything that we think, do, and say. Bless these people who hear Your Word today at Believer's Chapel. Bless them. Fortify them. Encourage them. Give them the burning heart of the Emmaus traveler because these things are trustworthy. In Jesus' name, Amen.